from Proverbs chapter 6, first 11 verses. My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, if you have shaken hands in pledge for a stranger, you have been trapped by what you said and snared by the words of your mouth. So do this, my son, to free yourself, since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands. Go to the point of exhaustion and give your neighbor no rest. Allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer, no ruler. Yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. Thanks, Vic, for uh, reading for us this morning. Uh, yesterday, uh, Sharon and I went to, uh, to buy some paint, and uh, just basically go into the paint store, and as you can see, we got three little musketeers with us, so uh, shopping always takes a lot longer than my normal pace. Anyhow, in this store, they had these uh, a body scents. Is that what they were? Body scents? They, uh, and you could, you could spray this stuff on you. And they had flavors or scents like uh, dirt or uh, uh, Play-Doh. Or there was the normal things like uh, flowers and stuff like that. Uh, but the most bizarre, funeral home. So, if you want to smell like a funeral home, talk to me. I've got a guy I can hook you up. Um, now, this is the most bizarre store that I think I've ever been in. It, it has to do with paint. It's a, it's a paint store. But there's clothes, there's furniture, there's these scent things, there's knickknacks of all kinds. And uh, it, it's, it's just... From my perspective, it's, it's, it's bizarre. But it kind of uh, led me to think about what we're talking about today. And that is, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about the, the money monster, which is uh, basically our, our desire to accumulate, to uh, live a consumer's lifestyle, to buy all this stuff that we don't really need. Uh, on the other hand, God calls us to a life of service and a life of generosity, of, of giving freely to others. Uh, the money monster uh, drives us to stockpile and to accumulate and to uh, burn through things. Now, a number of people talked to, uh, to me last time after the sermon and said, that this is so practical and, and we need more teaching on this kind of stuff. So, uh, next week, we're starting a series for the fall into uh, uh, 1 Samuel. And first, the book of 1 Samuel is about the first two kings of Israel, the king the people wanted, the king like all the other nations, versus the king that God wanted. And we're going to do a series there about uh, choose your king. And it has uh, huge numbers of uh, pictures of Jesus in that. But for today, we're going to uh, stick with this uh, money theme. And uh, there's, no, uh, there's nothing more practical to authentic Christian living than, uh, than the integrity, the honesty, the godliness with which we handle the things that God has given to us. Uh, there are also few topics that are closer to our hearts than talking about money. But God wants us to experience financial authenticity he wants us to honor him in every area of our lives, including uh, our money. And he doesn't want us to be mastered by our money, but he wants us instead to master it. He wants us to be free from indebtedness and unexpected uh, uh, expenses that can 
crash our world. He wants us to live within our means and, to, and have savings so that we aren't caught off guard when unexpected expenses come. A few years ago, there was a book that was popular called Margins. And the, the gist of the book is that when you write uh, out in, in a notebook, there's always a white strip around the edge. There's margin. And if you want to make some corrections or make some notes, you can write in the margin. But what happens if you write from one edge of the paper all the way to the other and there is no margin? And you want to add something, there's nowhere to add. The book isn't about us taking notes. It's about living our lives. And some of us live our lives uh, energy-wise, time-wise, where we're we got the gas pedal down all the way from morning till night. There's no margin. So if we get a little bit sick or so, our whole lives can fall apart and burn out. The same applies with our finances. If we're living in our lives with no margin, all of a sudden an unexpected expense comes along, our whole world can come crashing down. So in order to move us towards financial authenticity this morning, I'd like to talk basically about how we use the stuff that God has given to us, and particularly, what does the Bible say about debt? And we're going to start off by talking about what the Bible does not say about debt. What the Bible does not say about debt. Okay, first of all, it does not say that it's wrong to borrow money. The Bible gives lots of warnings about being in debt. However, nowhere does it say that it's wrong to borrow money. Sometimes people look to a verse like Romans 13, verse 8, as proof that it's wrong to borrow money. But the verse says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow men will be, uh, has fulfilled the law. Now, this verse uh, uh, tells us to repay our debts, but it doesn't say that it's wrong to borrow money. Secondly, it doesn't say that it's wrong to lend money. Just as it's not a sin to borrow money, it's not a sin to lend money to someone else. Now, in the Old Testament, when one Israelite was to, borrow, or to lend money to another, another Israelite, he was to do so without charging interest. This summer, uh, Jimmy Carter was here in Winnipeg with Habitat for Humanity. And I remember hearing an interview a few years ago that Jimmy Carter did about Habitat for Humanity, and they don't charge interest because of the Old Testament instructions of lending to the poor. I know a number of people who have helped others that meet critical needs in their lives by lending them money without uh, charging interest. We have done that as a church at times. We've lent money to people without interest so that they could meet individual needs. Uh, when you do that, you need to also be aware that repayment may take a long time and it may never actually happen. So the Bible does not say it's wrong to borrow money. It doesn't say that it's wrong to lend money. Third, it does not say that it's wise to borrow money. Leverage is not a biblical condoned way of making prosper or getting prosperous. Many people have fallen into the trap of using leverage. Leverage is the practice of putting other people's work, uh, other people's money to work for you. You borrow money and then you invest that money or you use that money to make money. Uh, some years ago, a, a pastor friend of mine quit being a pastor and became a financial advisor. He came to me. He wanted me to remortgage my house, take that money, and invest it. And he had all these numbers, and uh, I could have made a fortune according to him. That's called leverage. Uh, I followed. I, uh, I, I didn't do this. But I followed through. And if I had done what he said, we would now not own a house. With the opportunity to make a bunch also comes the opportunity to lose a bunch. And uh, the, the Bible warns against uh, uh, debt. Uh, so the Bible doesn't say that it's 
wrong to borrow money, but it doesn't say that it's wise to borrow money. It doesn't say that leverage is a way to prosperity. Rather, the Bible warns against the use of debt. Uh, fourth, God, the Bible does not say that God will bail you out of debt. The Bible nowhere says that God is obligated to bail you out of debt. Some Christians feel that God has promised to get them out of the situations they're in. They quote a verse like Philippians 4, verse 19. It says, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now, this promise is true. God will supply our needs, but that promise doesn't uh, mean that he is obligated to to bail us out of unwise decisions that we've made. Maybe a most uh, uh, vivid illustration that I could use is, say, I found the biggest, tallest building in Winnipeg. Climbed to the top, got to the top, jumped over the edge, and on my way down, I'm claiming this verse, which says, God will supply all my needs, and my need right now is a soft landing. God doesn't normally intervene in the laws, uh, the natural laws he's established. And so Billy Sunday put it this way. He said, a sinner can repent of his sin, but stupid is forever. God is not obligated to bail us out of stupid financial decisions we've made that result in debt. We must not try to manipulate God to do something he's not promised to do. Now, it's always interesting to me how committed or spiritual people become when, as a result of their foolish decisions, they're about to lose, uh, in one case this last year, the person was, uh, was about to lose $250,000 because of decisions he'd made. It's always interesting to me how spiritual and how uh, desirous of prayer they become when uh, there's a lot of money on the line. The Bible doesn't promise that God's going to bail us out of debt when we've made bad decisions. Fifth, debt, it does not say that debt is an exercise in faith. The underlying assumption here is that because we're borrowing money that we're going to have to pay back in the future, it requires faith to borrow the money because we're relying upon God. This is often the argument used by churches looking to raise money for a building program. Uh, the idea is we borrow money now, and it's a step of faith because it obligates us to pay back in the future what we don't have right now. Now, I don't see the Bible anywhere saying that borrowing money is a step of faith. You could argue that it's a greater step of faith to uh, look to God to provide the means somewhere, some way other than actually borrowing, that God would miraculously provide the money. Now, I'm not saying that borrowing is wrong, but I am saying that God may have a better way for you, something better in store for you than actually borrowing the money. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Now, what does the Bible actually say about debt? Well, first of all, it's saying all borrowing must be repaid. Psalm 37, verse 21. The wicked borrow and never repay, but the godly are generous givers. The conclusion of this verse is obvious. If you borrow money, you have to repay it. If you don't repay it, you come under the category of what the Bible calls as wicked. Second thing the Bible says is surety is foolish. Surety is guaranteeing another person's loan. It's, uh, we often call it co-signing. We're co-signing for someone. The Bible says that surety is foolish. It, it, in the verses that Vic read for us this morning, it, uh, it's saying if you have already done that, do everything you can to get yourself out from underneath that situation. So it warns us against surety. Let me read for you a part of what Vic read again. This is Proverbs 6. My child, if you have put up security for your friend's debt or guaranteed or agreed to guarantee the debt of a stranger, if you have trapped yourself by your agreement and are caught by what you said, follow my, my advice and save yourself. For if you, you place yourself at your friend's mercy, 
Now swallow your pride, go and beg, and have your name erased. Don't put it off, do it now. Don't rest until you do. Save yourself like a gazelle escaping from a hunter, like a bird fleeing from a nest. And then a little bit farther down in Proverbs, Proverbs uh, chapter 11, there's danger in putting up security for a stranger's debt. It's safer not to guarantee another person's debt. Uh, someone told me recently about a university student. Uh, her roommate was having a very difficult time getting a student loan, and, and so she kind of got talked into co-signing for her roommate's uh, uh, loan. That roommate made two payments and then took off. And now, a couple years later, the debt collectors are coming after her for, uh, for co-signing the loan. So security, putting up uh, uh, surety for someone else is a dangerous thing. You say to me, but Russ, this is a good friend. This is a family member. If I don't guarantee, if I don't co-sign this loan, it's going to destroy my relationship. Well, I'll tell you, it will, uh, even if you do, it's going to affect your relationship, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later as well. But say there are situations where you feel that you have to co-sign. Then if you're doing that, then be biblical in doing it. View this as a personal debt that you are assuming upon yourself. You need a guaranteed way to repay, and you must be prepared to repay it yourself uh, if the need arises with no expectation that your friend or your relative is going to pay you back. So the second thing the Bible says is a surety is foolish. The third thing is it says debt always presumes upon the future. If you borrow money and you believe uh, that borrowed money needs to be repaid, you are presuming upon the future unless you have a guaranteed way to repay the debt. If you think you have the ability to pay, uh, to repay, but in fact you don't because circumstances have changed, you have presumed upon the future. Listen to James chapter 4. Look here. You who say today or tomorrow we are going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year, we will do business there and make a profit, how do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here for a little while, then it is gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. When borrowing, we need to ask ourselves, what assumptions are we making about repaying? For example, I might assume that my health continues. I might assume that the asset that I'm borrowing against is going to continue to rise in value. I might assume that the company I work for or the company I own will continue to make a profit. But if circumstances change, and any of these things change, all of a sudden I can find myself where I am in, in deep bondage because I have no guaranteed way to, to repay. I've presumed upon the future. So the logical question is, is there ever a circumstance in which we can borrow without presuming upon the future? And the answer is yes. The key is having a guaranteed way to repay. That's not based upon assumptions. Now, the fourth thing that the Bible says about debt is that debt will enslave us. Proverbs 22, verse 7. Just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. You know the golden rule, right? Well, here's the golden rule with a twist. The one with the gold rules. I said before that when you lend money to a family member, it affects your relationship with that family member. This is why. I, I've seen situations where, you know, dad has lent money to son, and son is repaying, but son also likes to go out for pizza and 
go to a movie and dad is thinking, if he went out to less movies and less pizza, he could pay me back a lot faster. And it created tension. Debt enslaves us. The rich rule the poor. A fifth thing it says is borrowing may deny God an opportunity. God is interested in increasing our faith. Without question, God will meet the needs we have. Therefore, I believe that many, in many cases, when we borrow money, we're actually denying God an opportunity to do his thing, to meet our needs and show uh, how wonderful he is. Now, when Sharon and I went to seminary, uh, we, I had just graduated from college. She'd been in college. And in April, we had zero money. And, but we had a job lined up, or we were working on having it lined up, and our church came to us and said, if you go to seminary, we'll pay your tuition. But, uh, and there was a process where we knew that God was, was leading us. So for, I worked from April to Christmas. Half of what we, t- we made there I used to buy a car. We had a, uh, our oldest child in the meantime. And we were moving down to California. In those days, the Canadian dollar wasn't great. Sharon couldn't get a work visa. And uh, we had enough money to last us about six months. Uh, we could have packed everything we owned into a small U- the smallest U-Haul trailer there, but our box spring wouldn't fit in the door. So we had the second smallest U-Haul trailer you could get. But we had committed ourselves, we were not going to go into debt. And we did one, we lived one quarter at a time, school, one school quarter at a time. Now, to be honest with you, I still don't really know how exactly this worked. But we were willing to lower our standard of living. We lived in a ghetto. I could tell you about our neighbor shooting our friend. Um about daily, or just about daily beatings outside our, our window, uh, the husband throwing his wife down the stairs, and me kind of catching her at the bottom. Uh, but God miraculously supplied for us, and we didn't mind living in that ghetto. It was actually kind of cool. Uh, we came back. Uh, three years later, back into Canada, no debt. Our, say, about the same amount of money in the bank as when we left. And now instead of a U-Haul trailer, we came with a U-Haul truck. I don't know how that worked. I still don't know exactly how that worked. But I believe that if we had taken a student loan we would have denied God the opportunity to provide for our needs. Now, I'm not saying that God is always going to work this way. But I am saying he will work that way more often than we tend to believe. The bottom line is, don't ever put a lender in the place of God by depending upon the lender to meet your need. And don't ever play the part of God by determining that the only way your need can be met is by borrowing. Okay, so now that we've seen what the Bible does and does not say about debt, let me conclude by saying a little bit about a financial plan. A plan to mastering your money rather than having your money master you. As we saw last time, the first step in dealing with money issues is to pursue a vital relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, We have a hunger in our souls that is only met in relationship with Christ. But in this world, we often try to uh, meet that hunger in our souls with things. So we buy stuff, a new car, a bigger house, fancy clothes, exotic vacations, all in in a drive to kind of fill what's missing there. Uh, the first step in getting grips of our finances is that vital relationship with Christ so that we don't have to try to fill what's missing with, with stuff, with our spending. The second step 
in mastering our money is what I call a financial plan. And this is the where, the, where most people, or a lot of people, ha, ha, struggle. It's not that they don't earn enough money, but it's how they manage the money that they've made. Uh, this is just simple, simple numbers. But if you make $25,000 a year, that means over your lifetime, you're going to make more than a million dollars. If you make $50,000 a year, over your lifetime, you're going to make more than $2 million. We need a plan on how to manage what it is that we make. And here's, uh, here's the, it's a simple three-step plan. The first step is to pay God, uh, to give your tithe. Giving the tithe allows us to express our thankfulness to God, and it shows that we believe that this stuff isn't really ours. We're just stewards of it. Now, it doesn't make sense to, the, the, the first step to financial freedom is to give stuff away. Like, like how does that work? It doesn't make sense. But in God's economy, it works. Giving money away is devastating to the, uh, to the money monster in our lives. And it can change us. Now, l- let me just, uh, I'll use ro- round numbers. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll just go over. Say, say I make $100,000 a year. Or between me and my wife. We make $100,000 a year. In 10 years, I've made a million dollars. Okay, so $100,000 a year, 10 years, I've made a million dollars. Now, here's what I believe. God can make, so if I give, in, of that million, over the 10 years, if I give God 100000 of that, and I keep 900000 I believe, without a doubt, that God will make that $900,000 go way way farther than I could possibly make that million go. When the Israelites uh, traveled through the the wilderness, their shoes didn't wear out, their clothes didn't wear out. Uh, That's part of what happened to us when we lived in Fresno. Nothing broke, nothing wore out. Uh, so, but this isn't a sermon on tithing. So the first step is to pay God. The second step is to pay yourself. Now, this is uh, from an article in the Globe and Mail from last year. Uh, let me just read what it, uh, it says. A large percentage of older working Canadians are heading into retirement without adequate savings to keep them out of poverty, and to, uh, a new su- uh, study suggests. Half of Canadian couples between 55 and 64 have no employer pension between them. And of those, less than 20% of middle-class income families have saved enough to adequately supply, supplement governmental benefits. The vast majority of these Canadians retiring without an employer pension plan have totally inadequate retirement savings. Among all Canadians ages 55 to 64 without pensions, half have only enough savings to last about one year. Income trends suggest that the percentage of Canadian seniors living in poverty will increase in the coming years. The poverty rate for seniors will climb. Now that's the end of the the quote. Now, for many of these people, it's not that they didn't earn enough. In their working years, they'll have made hundreds of thousands of dollars. But when it comes to retirement, did you hear that? That's a huge percentage of Canadians that have uh, have enough money or do not have enough money to last basically a year. They've made hundreds of thousands, and now when they come to the end, they, they're going to run out. Why? Because they paid everyone else but themselves. As I was working on this sermon, driving home from church one, one afternoon, uh, on the radio I heard that they were talking to a CIBC analyst. 
and he was talking about uh, university students. And this is what he said, 40% of university students in Canada, he was talking about uh, the students across Canada, 40% of university students in Canada have zero savings when they start university. Zero savings. They haven't saved anything. Their parents haven't saved anything for them. The second step in this financial plan is to pay yourself without apology, without embarrassment. How much? Well, many financial experts uh, recommend about 10%. It takes discipline to put money away and not spend it. It takes uh, willpower to say no to tempting purchases. It takes commitment to a principle of pay now and play later. The world tells us the others, uh, uh, play now, pay later. You see ads from the brick, buy this furniture, you don't have to pay for it for 18 months. Pay, uh, play now, pay later. Notice what Proverbs says. There's a little bit more from what Vic read. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. Follow the ant. Work when you can. Set aside provision uh, so that you'll be prepared for when you can't work. Or uh, Proverbs 21. The wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. So the third step, the, the first step is pay God. Second step, pay yourself. The third step is to live on the rest, live on the 80%. Giving God 10% and saving 10% leaves 80% to live on. Now this is precisely the point where many people cave in. Usually it's not that they can't live on that 80%, it's just they don't want to. They simply refuse to limit their living expenses. Rather than alternate, uh, altering their living, their lifestyle uh, by living in a smaller home, driving a cheaper car, buying fewer clothes, they eliminate the tithing and the saving. By eliminating the tithing, they undo or disconnect themselves from God's supernatural involvement in their finances. And by cutting off the savings, they eliminate the freedom of having an emergency fund or having stuff put away for their retirement. Now, it's bad enough when we uh, are spending everything. What's worse is sooner or later then we get to a point where we are uh, spending more than we're earning. And the first emergency comes, the first crisis, and we are in financial ruin. Living without margin. And you can't live without margin financially and not end up in trouble at some point. Now, very few people would consider driving around without a gas gauge. You know the inconvenience and danger of driving without a gas gauge. And yet a lot of people uh, uh, handle their personal finances without a spending gauge. They casually spend money here and there, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of the month, they run out of money and they say, oh no, what am I going to do? Or what's worse, I think, is you turn 65 or 70 and you're gonna, now you're saying, what am I going to do? The only way to answer is to have a spending gauge, to have a financial plan, to know uh to know what you're going to do, and then the discipline to stick with it. In conclusion, Christianity is meant to be practical. It means that Christians have radical, radically different priorities and values than those who live around them. Nothing is more practical than the way we use the stuff that God has entrusted to us. Now, let's be people who handle our money wisely. God wants us to master our money rather than be mastered by our money. Money is to serve us rather than us serving our money. Now, if you're interested more in, uh, in this topic, our conference has, has these little books. Uh, they're free. 
Uh, last time I talked about it, I had about 25 of them, and they, they all disappeared. Um, there's a few more. I, I got a few more. And they, they help you with the very things that I was talking about today. Uh, uh, financial planning. It uh, even goes into things like uh, uh, power of attorney and a will and uh, budgets and spending and saving habits. And they're just on the back. And uh, they're, they're from our conference, and you're free to take them. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you've uh, blessed us materially. And so we want to be good stewards of the, the stuff that you give to us. We thank you for our health so that we have opportunity to earn. And uh, we want to live in ways that honor you with, uh, with, our, uh, with what you've given to us. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.